Good evening. Dunedin has an embarrassing problem. People have been talking about the strange, rotten, sulfury smell that hits pockets of the city without warning. We sent Kim Howring to sniff it out. Have you noticed it? Sort of a, an unpleasant smell in the air. And I'm not the only one to have copped a whiff of a really bad sulphur smell that's been hanging over the city recently. It was here the day before yesterday. Yes, I have noticed it. Yes. Yeah, it stinks. It smells awful. It's like a sulphury smell. Even the city health inspectors noticed it. I think it's coal-fired uh, appliances, uh, large uh, chimneys around the area, which would cause the problem. Is it a new problem or has it been with us in the past? I suspect that it's worse than it has been, otherwise we wouldn't be getting the level of complaint and people are noticing it. And I, th I rather suspect that the quality of the coal or the sulphur content of the coal is worse than it has been in the past. There are two schools of thought about where the smell's coming from. One is the Ravensdown Fertiliser Works, which the Department of Health has been working on for some time. The, the industry has had to go and find phosphate rocks from further around the world. The, the Pacific rocks have become uh, worked out and so the, the industry across the country has had to look at phosphate rocks from uh, other parts of the world. And these, these are have smellier rocks? Yes, though. they are. In fact, the fertiliser works problem is a national one and the health department will discuss it with this country's three major companies next month. The company here confirms it's been using different rocks but says there've always been smells associated with superphosphate manufacture and there always will. The second possible source of the odour, which is officially called hydrogen sulphide, is from commercial and domestic burners. People have been going for cheaper grade coals for a couple of years now, and it's these which give off the rotten egg smell. It's not strictly classified as a health risk, but it can affect health. But individuals uh, who are badly affected in a, from a local pollution problem well, uh, it'll adversely affect their health because they won't feel uh, right about it and they'll be uncomfortable and, uh, and if they've got bronchitis or something it may affect that, uh, make it worse. We do get a lot of complaint from people who suggest that their health is being affected and I'm sure it is. It is a problem in the sense that there's too many people complaining about it. A large scale switch back to electric heating may be the only answer to the smog problem, but the consolation is that at least the odour isn't as bad as Rotorua. A 33-year-old Dunedin sales representative today pleaded guilty to using his employer's checkbook for financial gain. Mervyn Charles Chave wrote cheques totalling $252,000 while supervisor of the Savings and Loans Department of the PSIS in Dunedin. The court was told all the money has since been paid back. He was convicted and remanded for sentence. A tentative agreement has been signed by the Vincent County Council and government agencies which brings the long-awaited Ernstclew irrigation scheme a stage closer to reality. Alan Brady reports. Ernstclew orchardists were pruning today, still uncertain about exactly how their fruit trees will be irrigated in the future or how much they'll have to pay for it. But the agreement signed on behalf of the irrigators by the Vincent County Council at least keeps alive the prospect of water eventually flowing from the Clyde Dam to the Ernstclew Flats. We intend to damn well make them hold to it. No, no, no uh, way about it. In fact, we have uh, the support of the ex-Director General of Agriculture, Mr John Herkus, and whom I have a great deal of faith in. He has been put in charge, and he has said he will see it through. Important details still have to be worked out between the main parties, the County Council, Electrocorp, and other government agencies, before the scheme goes ahead. But it seems likely the government will stand by its pledge to pay for half the cost of the headworks and half the cost of piping the water to irrigators. Just how much Electrocorp is prepared to pay is one of the remaining grey areas. But after 15 years of pruning their way through red tape, orchardists are cautiously optimistic the efforts of their negotiators will finally bear fruit. 
While in the Kangol's attention has been focused on the new library, there's been a revolution in architecture going on in one of the city's most orthodox buildings. It's the Southern Museum, which is closed while the renovations are underway. And as Cathy Graham reports, in the Kangol, people are likely to get quite a surprise when the new roof finally starts to take shape. The museum's opening 47 years ago marked the province's centennial. Next year, its transformation into a pyramid will be the focus of the 1990 celebrations in Southland. And while there's still not much more than a hint of what's to come at the front of the building, behind the brick facade, three floors have already taken shape, with room for two more at a later stage. They'll all be contained in the pyramid-shaped roof, which will make the building the equivalent of six storeys tall. Well, we think it's the largest uh, modern pyramid to be built. There was one recently finished in France, and ours is bigger than that one. So will you be going for the Guinness Book of Records? Well, it might be an idea. It'll cost just on $2 million to build the three floors. That's being met by bequests, donations and half a million from local authorities. Just one of the many features will be a chance for the people of Invercargill to see the view from the top via a revolving camera. And the building itself will come to life as this model demonstrates. pyramid shape should be visible in a few weeks, but the official opening won't be till next June, on the shortest day. The European hotel in Dunedin had more customers today than it's had in many a year, but there was no money changing hands over the bar. The crowds were there for the auction of hotel furnishings and equipment prior to the refurbishment of the premises, which is scheduled to begin next month. The catalogue included everything from champagne glasses to vacuum cleaners, and several hundred people turned out for what was a particularly speedy auction. More than 500 lots came under Warwick Grimmer's hammer, clearing out the hotel for the owners, who planned to gut and rebuild it before Christmas. A search by Television New Zealand's Natural History Unit for film footage of black coral has led to the discovery of a wrecked boat. While recording shots for a documentary called Under Fiordland in Milford Sound, the crew came across a fishing boat which sank about 15 years ago. The wreck was not the sunken treasure the television crew expected to find 100 metres or so under Milford Sound. They were looking for black coral. But while using their remotely operated underwater camera, they came across what they thought at first was a crayfish pot. It turned out to be the well-preserved wreck of what's thought to be the Four Winds, which sank near Bridal Vale Falls in 1974. An investigation by the remote camera, which can operate far deeper than human divers, revealed that the wreck seems largely complete. And while it's of little use now as a cray fishing boat, it is at least providing a home for someone. And that's the programme for tonight. We'll be back tomorrow. Good night.